Good evening and welcome to Emory Law School for this important National Civil Rights Conference. On behalf of Dean Partlett and the rest of the administration and faculty, I want to thank all of you for being here to take part in what we hope will be a very important conference and discussion about access to justice. I want to especially thank, of course, our event sponsors, the Center for Advocacy and Dispute Resolution here at Emory Law, the American Constitution Society, the Emory Black Law Students Association, the Emory Public Interest Committee, Smith Gambrell and Russell, LLP, Reuben Gutman, Cook Hall and Lampros, LLP, Mooney Green, Baker and Sandin, PC, Chitwood Harley Harnes, LLP, Smith, Humphrey, and Verbit, PL. Thank you very, very much for making this event happen tonight and tomorrow. We appreciate your support. But enough about tomorrow. Tonight, let's go back in time a little bit. In fact, let's go back 50 years to 1960. Thurgood Marshall, Jack Greenberg, and the lawyers of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund have won Brown versus Board of Education in the United States Supreme Court. Mrs. Rosa Parks' brave stand in Montgomery has already happened. It's some years past, and the ensuing boycott has introduced America to a young minister, an Atlanta native, born right down the street from where we are tonight, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. King has co-founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, organizing the growing civil rights movement along principles of nonviolence and civil disobedience. Nine brave children have already integrated Little Rock High School with the help of federal troops and the National Guard sent by President Eisenhower. And yet, in early 1960, the South is still segregated. Emmett Till's known murderers are free. Black Americans who try to register to vote are beaten, fired, forced from their homes, and shut out of their businesses. The University of Georgia still refuses, in 1960, to admit black students. In 1960, this university is still for whites only. Colleges and schools throughout the South are still segregated by race, and black schools are starved for resources. Black Americans cannot shop, eat, or stay in the commercial establishments that eagerly serve white customers. In fact, in many parts of the South, they can't even drink from the same water fountains. And black Americans, most of all, risk their lives when they try to claim their rights. All too often, their oppression is carried out by the law itself, by the laws on the books, by the lawmakers, by law enforcement, by the judges and the courts. And yet, by the end of 1960, groups of young college students start sitting in at lunch counters throughout the South. Among their leaders is a very young John Lewis, our congressman. They organize the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and they become a major force in the civil rights movement. By the end of 1960, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund has won the court victories that will open the door for Ms. Charlene Hunter and Mr. Hamilton Holmes to enter the University of Georgia in January of 1961. This law school and its dean and faculty start planning the lawsuit that ultimately would overturn the Georgia Constitution's prohibition on integration of colleges, schools, and universities, and soon would bring the first black students to Emory. Judge Albert Tuttle, a decorated war hero, becomes the chief judge of the Fifth Circuit 
U.S. Court of Appeals sitting here in Atlanta and holding appellate jurisdiction over most of the Deep South. The Congress of Racial Equality is starting to organize an event called Freedom Rides that will begin the following spring and summer. And in that same year, 1960, our honored guest tonight moves his wife and kids to Washington, D.C. and becomes the first assistant in the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division in the last days of the Eisenhower administration. Luckily, the presidential victor in 1960's election, John F. Kennedy, decides to keep him. And so he stays to work for the new Attorney General of the United States, Robert Kennedy. What follows here is the story of one man among many, many men, many women, who brought desperately needed change to our country. To any of my students who are here tonight, I would say to you that this is one man, one lawyer, who exemplifies integrity, professionalism, and courage in the practice of law. To me, he embodies the simple words so often attributed to Robert Kennedy. If not me, who? If not now, when? But maybe I should just close with our guest's own words when asked how and why he acted bravely. It seemed like the right thing to do. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our privilege to have with us tonight Mr. John Doerr, a trailblazer for justice. Mr. Doerr. We would love to hear your reflections on that very turbulent era and your leadership role in what you did in the Civil Rights Division. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to be here. And these, uh, this film brings back memories that I have clearly in my mind. Uh, I thought I would speak for just a few minutes about <clears throat> those times. I'm speaking of the times in 1960 to 1965, which um, although I didn't realize it then, nor appreciate it, uh, I think it's accurate to characterize them as revolutionary times. And uh, there was a <clears throat> feeling among the black community that uh, these times were made for action and the blacks intended to take action. Uh, one of the leading intellectuals in the black civil rights movement was a woman named Ella Baker. And uh, at one time she, she wrote this in order for us as poor and oppressed people to become part of a society that is meaningful, the system under which we now exist has to be radically changed. The system under which we now exist has to be radically changed. It means facing a system that does not lend itself to your needs and devising means by which you can change that system. It means facing a system that does not lend itself to your needs and devising means by which you can change that system. And, oh, what were the forces? The, the, the forces really, whites versus blacks. The whites were, uh, locked into a political system that uh, had its basis, I think, in, in the solid South. And uh, there wasn't anybody with the strength or the political ability to change that. Uh, I don't think any of the political leaders wanted to change it. And uh, 
On the other hand, there were, beginning in 1950 through the 50s, there were individual blacks and organizations of blacks throughout Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana that were not uh, any getting any headlines at all or any attention, nor did anybody have any real knowledge of what they were doing. But th th there, there was movement there, and it was a revolutionary movement. To give you some ex a few, just a few examples of that, take the uh, individual farmer named Francis Joseph Atlas, who lived in East Carroll Parish, Louisiana. He went down to New Orleans and testified before the Civil Rights Commission about his experiencing and trying to get registered to vote in East Carroll Parish, where you had to have two vouchers for you before you could register. And of course, there were no blacks registered and no whites would would vouch for a black. And he testified to that. That news got in the papers in Louisiana. And the very day that he got back from Louisiana from testifying, the sheriff came to his, his door and uh, said to him, uh, You're, he was a cotton farmer, you're cotton owned gin. And uh, Mr. Atlas said, why? And he said, civil rights. Uh, I think of, a, of, a, of an organization of local blacks made up primarily of uh, former servicemen in World War II in Fayette and Haywood counties, uh, Tennessee, 1960, these two organizations, completely local, completely determined to have uh, organizations designed to improve their, their lot in the communities. What they were really after was the right to sit on juries. And when they began to organize, they were confronted with extreme and savage economic intimidation and retaliation. Uh, one night in September or October 1960, I went to a small church in Haywood County I walked into the church and there were maybe a hundred black people in the in the rows of the church. It was just a small country church on had cement blocks on the four corners. And I got to the front of the of the church and I said that told them who I was and where I was from and I asked how many of you people have been asked to move off your the land. They were all tenant sharecroppers. Every single person in that room raised their hand. These people were poor, they were honest, they were not troublemakers, but they were just absolutely victims of this terrible struggle between the whites and the blacks. And then uh, you move on to, to uh, the national organizations. Uh, I speak first of CORE. And uh, Jim Farmer, of course, got the idea of having this, this freedom ride through the South. And uh, it just, it, 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 before, before they got four miles into Alabama, it got out of hand. And uh, there was violence, there was brutality, there was bus burnings, there was beatings, there was arrests. And uh, before they got out of, before they got out of Birmingham, and uh, efforts were made to fly them to from from Birmingham to to New Orleans, and uh, all the, reluctantly, I think the leaders of the Freedom Ride movement agreed to do that. <clears throat> but just as soon as they agreed, Diane Diane Nash, a young student at Fisk University in in Nashville and her colleagues <clears throat> said, we're, we're going. And they got on their cars and went to Birmingham. 
to become freedom writers. Now, <clears throat> there's a documentary that's coming out in a few months about the freedom rides, and if you, 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 I urge you to see it because it it gives you an idea how serious the situation was, and what danger, and what risks, and how uh, uh, the country was really lucky that we didn't start to come apart at the one uh, completely, and. Uh, they finally did get police protection to go to Jackson, but then the, the government, federal government, made an agreement with the Mississippi authorities that if they would maintain law and order, uh, that they could they could take action under their police authority, and, and uh, they set out to to really fill the jails in Mississippi with Freedom Riders. When the Freedom Riders uh, set out to oblige them and more and more people came to Mississippi till you had five or six hundred people under arrest in, in jail and prison in, in Mississippi. That was COFO, CORE, that was CORE, CORE. Then you take SNCC, uh, the students, they have those sit-ins in North Carolina and uh, uh, John Lewis and uh, Bob Moses and uh, Jim Foreman and uh, the rest of them all uh, decided that they were going to take on the system. And uh, some of the members wanted to do direct action and some wanted to do uh, uh, voting. And uh, they agreed to do, they do both. And uh, the, the members of the of the SNCs that wanted to do voting were really under the direction of the f a field operator named Bob Moses and he had come under the influence of Ella Baker after he had left his teaching job at Horace Mann in New York and uh, she sent him into Mississippi in the summer of 1960 to look around and in 1961, when he finished his third year of teaching at Horace Mann, he went back and he picks the, one of the toughest parts of Mississippi, the Southwest Mississippi, to start a voter registration. And uh, it wasn't three weeks before the whole thing blew up. Uh, I happened to be in Jackson and he told me what was happening and and I said, let's, why don't we go down there? So on a Sunday afternoon, we went down to, to Amit County in southwest Mississippi. And that talking to Mr. Steptoe about conditions. And I asked him if he, if he uh, uh, had seen uh, who the white people were that were taking down license numbers at these voter registration schools. And he said he hadn't, but a Mr. Lee had. So. We decided to go see Mr. Lee, but we couldn't find him. He was away. So I had to go back to Washington. So I told Bob I'd come back and see him the next time I was there. But the next morning, he and Mr. Hurst, who was the state senator, white state senator from that area, allegedly got into an argument. Mr. Mr. Hurst shot and killed Lee. Uh, and you have SCLC and Dr. King's organization, and he was committed to nonviolent um, direct action, but that always built up uh, enormous tension among the whites. And uh, as you can recall, if you recall Albany, Georgia, or Birmingham, and uh, then you you look at the letter that. Dr. King wrote from the jail in, in Birmingham, and he had this terrific power with words, and he could, he could, peel, he could peel to people, and for, peel for him for action. And uh, this, went on, this went on that, in that way with CORE and SNCC and SCLC and Dr. King and Bob Moses and hundreds of others pushing and pushing and, uh, 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 and still 
uh, there was no give among the uh, political leaders or the business leaders in Mississippi, Alabama, or Louisiana. And uh, I think they believed that if the time was really on their side and if they just held firm uh, long enough, that this whole pressure from the blacks would go away. And you see, they had, they had the senators, they had the representatives, they had the judges, they had the sheriffs, they had the governor. And the understanding was as long as those men, those politicians, could keep the status quo, there wouldn't be any violence. But Bob Moses decided that, that uh, he wasn't getting uh, enough progress with respect to the voter drives that he had, the organization. And, and so he organized the Mississippi summer of 64. And then uh, with that, uh, uh, the, the violence really just went up. There were church burnings, and there were beatings, and then there were the, the, murder, the mur murders in Neshoba County. <clears throat> and that takes us up to, to the winter of 65 in Selma, when everything came together, and out of that came the passage of the Voting Rights Act. Now, <clears throat> I want to talk just a few minutes about this, this the, law enforcement uh, by the federal government, um, what the strategy was. I think the st strategy, uh, I don't agree with the, who, the commentator who said that the Kennedys weren't uh, uh, sincere with respect to their efforts to change the course of the country in the period from 60 one to 64. Um, I, I don't deny that, that Robert Kennedy and his brother were uh, interested in re-election and they carried the f Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and Georgia in 1960. They didn't want to lose those in 64. But I never saw Robert Kennedy shrink from any uh, enforcement, any obligation, any responsibility to enforce the law. Uh, before he had any any uh, team of lawyers around him, uh, the, the case of the Francis Joseph Atlas was before him. Uh, we had filed that case in the, the 19th of January, 1961 one day before the inauguration changed. And what to do with that case was on his desk on January 22nd. And so I know what he did and how he reacted to that. And he reacted as you would hope of an attorney general would react. He charged and, and uh, got it resolved and, and then sent me down to be sure it was locked up and we, the cotton was ginned. Uh, but uh, there, there was, uh, there was uh, so the, the strategy of the Kennedys and Burke Marshall as I saw it was that if they were going to bring about this change they were going to have to get the three branches of the federal government to work together. Now the Constitution was designed to have separation of powers and so he could limit the power of any particular branch of the government. But Justice Jackson once wrote that, uh, that while that was the provisions of the Constitution, it really was intended that the, there would be reciprocity and cooperation between three branches of government. And in order to bring about a change, there had to be united efforts to get the job done by all three branches. 
That was the strategy of, of the high level government. Now, the Civil Rights Division was, was, had the responsibility of, of carrying that out. And it had to develop and test and try out various mechanisms to, uh, toward that aim. Uh, I don't want to tell you here that, that those, those uh, tactic, those strategies and tactics was designed by Attorney General Kennedy or I, uh, President Johnson, who I think of it as, a, as also an Attorney General, because in fact he acted as his own Attorney General in civil rights. Uh, but uh, the, civil, the young lawyers in the Civil Rights Division did a, a lot to develop the strategy and tactics uh, that contributed to the ultimate success of this revolutionary movement. That's not taking anything away from the blacks, the heroes, the people that really put their lives on the line at all. But it does say that if you've got to have of enforcement, a law enforcement mechanism working, not just sitting, but working uh, to uh, enforce the law. And uh, we, had, we had a strategy. The strategy was very simple. There are seven or eight judicial districts in the South in the Black Belt, and there's, the f first thing we do is gonna keep every one of those district judges busy. We we're going to bring cases in each one of the districts, and the second thing was we were going to we were going to move fast. We we're going to work hard, and the hard work would result in fast work, and uh, that's how we began. I'll give you an example in 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 Amet County in southwest Mississippi. One of Bob Moses' lieutenants was a fellow named John Hardy. He took two black elderly women in to register and the registrar, when he found out it was Hardy, uh, he uh, ordered him out of his office and hit, hit, hit him on the head with a, with a butt of a revolver. And uh, Hardy was bleeding and he stumbled out in the street looking for the sheriff. The sheriff found him and he tried to tell the sheriff what happened. The sheriff said, well, you're, up, you're down here creating disorder and he arrested him. And uh, we had a couple of lawyers down there, and they came back and <coughs> reported this that this was a Monday. They were I can still see it. They they came into my office and reported what they'd seen and what they'd heard, and <coughs> they said the case was, was a criminal prosecution in the in the Justice of the Peace Court, or the really in the, was going to begin on that Friday. And Burke Marshall came in, and he listened to what what what, it, what, the, what the facts were, what we knew, and he, he said without a hesitation, "Let's enjoin it." Now, the concept of the federal government enjoining enjoining in advance a state criminal prosecution was really unheard of. It never happened, and. We went, we went down, got the papers ready, and we were before Judge Cox on Thursday. Of course, he denied our application for an injunction, and we, were, we, we immediately went to the Court of Appeals. The, sit, the judge that was handling uh, motions and matters that week was Judge Reeves in, in, in Montgomery. And I called Judge Reeves and told him I had a matter to see him and when, when I could come to see him. He said, you can come anytime. And I said, tonight? And he said, yes, tonight. I said, how late? He said, any, as late as you can get here. How are you gonna get here? And I said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna charter a plane. He said, well, try to see if you can get the assistant attorney general who handled the case to go with you. So he's over here. So I called the assistant attorney general, told him I was going to Montgomery for a seek a, a, an injunction, temporary restraining order, stopping the prosecution, and he came along with me. 
we got to Judge Cruz Reeves' house at 11 o'clock at night. And he greeted us warmly and brought us into his study and sat down and he, he, he asked me to state my business and I told him that we wanted to stop the prosecution the next morning. And uh, he, he then said to Mr. Cates, the Assistant Attorney General from Mississippi, uh, what do you have to say? And Mr. Cates said, well, Judge, I ne never argued a case at 11.15 at night. <laughs> <laughs> How much time do I have? <laughs> Judge Reeves said, you can have all the time you want. Well, he had a big briefcase, and, and he said to one of those suitcases that lawyers carry, he said, I've got some authority in here. And he reached down, but the first thing he pulled out was his pajamas. <laughs> and then his toilet articles. And he laid them all on the floor here, and then he got his law books out. And he talked for some time, and Judge Reed was very courteous and listened and thoughtful. And he said, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to act independently. In the Court of Appeals, we try to act in threes, and I can't get a hold of the other judges by morning. And it wouldn't it be a good idea if you just agreed with me that, uh, that you would defer this case, the prosecution, for three or four weeks until I can assemble a, a, a court. Well, of course the Attorney General agreed. And within three weeks, um, Burke Marshall had argued the case before a three-judge court, and uh, Judge Reeves had issued an opinion that, that uh, justified the federal government taking the unusual practice of enjoining a, a state court prosecution. Uh, that was one thing. The other thing we did was, was that we adopted a, a tactic of, or a, 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 that we regarded uh, uh, if a Mississippi or Louisiana judge didn't act, we regarded it as a denial. And then we, we would appeal to the Fifth Circuit and seek an injunction pending appeal. And we did that in a case in Hattiesburg called U.S. versus Lynn. And uh, that, uh, that speed and that, that uh, tactic resulted in three federal judges, Judge Wisdom, Judge Brown, and Judge Bell, to go to Hattiesburg in the fall of 1962 and sit and listen for, for five days on a, on a contempt hearing. And <clears throat> by that time, the young lawyers in the division had, had, had a lot of experience on how to try these cases. And uh, they tried them with three different kinds of witnesses. You try them with educated, intelligent blacks. Then you try them, the second group was young college whites who had had no difficulty at all in registering without having going through anything. They just went in and signed their names. But they were away at college and, and they uh, were truthful. And then the third group was the uneducated, uh, illiterate black, whites. And w we played those three types of witnesses back and forth between, before Judge Bell and Judge Wisdom and Judge Brown for a week. And by the end of the week, they had made up their mind that there was just nothing to the registration rules in Mississippi, nothing whatsoever except it just absolutely purpose and effect was to keep blacks from voting. Then a year later, both of them, Judge Brown, Judge Wisdom wrote a great opinion in a statewide case called U.S. versus Mississippi. Judge Brown wrote a dissent in a, uh, excuse me, U.S. versus Louisiana. Judge Br Brown wrote a dissent in U.S. versus uh, Mississippi that had a great deal to do with helping to move the legislature, the Congress, with respect to uh, the need for, for action and really firm action. Uh, 
uh, at the same time, we also, young lawyers, there was one lawyer there named Dave Norman, who was as smart a lawyer as I've ever known. He, he had, uh, he first developed a theory of the, of the least qualified white, and that is that if we proved in a case that a county were registering unqualified whites, then that registrar was obliged to register blacks who went down to the, the uh, qualities or the, char or the characteristics of the least qualified white. That didn't get acceptance right away, but that really was the heart of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Uh, he, he, the, we coupled that with an argument that your a theory that you couldn't uh, create um, any educational requirements in Mississippi because the blacks had never had any educational opportunities. And that, uh, coupled with the least qualified whites, was really uh, was the basis of affirmative action. At any rate, we came to 1965, and, and uh, you know, you all know what happened at Selma, and then came the passage of the act that was uh, very, very uh, f f uh, dramatic and very forceful, and uh, Norman uh, conceived the idea of uh, let's start, let's start to to get the, the constitutional constitutionality decided in the Supreme Court. And he was able to craft a complaint that the Supreme Court accepted. And so within four or five months, the Supreme Court had upheld the validity, the constitutional validity of the, of the, of the, uh, of the Voting Rights Act. And then the, the division again uh, was by that time was pretty well organized and they had an effective way of of enforcing that by a barrage of correspondence with registrars across the whole South and monitoring uh, election or registration results every week. And that led to the first election after the Voting Rights Act, which was in Dallas County, Selma, between a segregationist sheriff and a fair-minded uh, police chief. And prior to that election, most people that voted in South Dallas County were 7,500 and maybe 40 of them were black. And in that election, 17,500 people voted and uh, Baker, Baker won. That, that brought us really to the to the, the f efforts to begin to make the criminal law meaningful. And uh, we had two cases before the end of 67, which at least established that it was possible to get convictions of white people who commit crimes against blacks. Now, that's that's, that's the, the history as I remember it. And I think I've probably talked too long already, but if uh, I would be happy to answer any questions. We have a couple of students who will walk around with uh, cordless microphones. So if you'll be patient while they get the microphones and then uh, to spare our guest from having to stare into the glare, um, I'll pick out questioners and uh, you will ask him your questions. So are we ready? Got the microphones going? Yep. Okay, we have a gentleman right here. You. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Doerr, we're left with a photograph of you on the screen. I don't know how old you are at that moment, uh, but you've had years to reflect on your motivations for moving into this beyond it was just my job. I wonder as a human being and as a lawyer if you would comment on your motivations for injecting yourself into the system. 
<coughs> well, I suppose there was, when I think about it, there was several reasons. Um, uh, I, my, my mother was a school teacher. My father was a very, very good lawyer. And uh, even though my father was the president of the school board in this little town where we lived, my mother didn't think that the, the uh, education was good, as good as she wanted to provide for her sons, her two sons. So she went over to St. Paul and found a, 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 public, a country day school, private school. And the head, headmaster said, well, if you send your sons over, this was 35 and 36, I'll find them a place to live and the tuition is only $500. So we went to a good, good high school, and, and uh, as a result of that, I was fortunate enough to, to be admitted to Princeton. And while at Princeton, there was, Princeton was a southern school in many, many ways. And uh, I had many friends. There were no blacks there, but I had many friends, and many of those friends were from the south. And occasionally we would discuss the race problem. And, what I would hear, what I remember, was they would say, well, we know we have a problem. But the worst thing that can happen if any Yankees come down there and try to do anything about it. So I went out to California to make my fortune, and then that didn't work out. I went back, <laughs> I went back to this little town, and, and so I practiced there for 10 years. And then one day I got a call from the assistant attorney general in the civil rights division asking me if I wanted to be uh, take the job as the first assistant. And uh, I know now, I knew later and I know now that he did a pretty wide canvas before he came to me, but nobody would take the job. <laughs> and, and that's true. Nobody wanted the job. It wasn't, it was, uh, and I said to Tyler, he was, he was a class ahead of me, I said, well, he said, we've got some interesting cases. I said, well, what kind? He said, we've got a case against Jimmy Hoffa. Now, what, what that, that has to do with civil rights and the, the, the big problem is hard to see. Uh, but it gives you the situation. So, but I wanted to do it. I didn't want to stay in New Richmond for the rest of my career. I was afraid that uh, sitting here now that I would feel I had missed something. And so uh, I said to my family, my wife, two children were going to go to Washington. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't three months after I got there that because of my experience as a country lawyer of investigating your own cases, that I said to Tyler, I believe I'll go down there. And so I went down and, and uh, brought the cases in Haywood County for Tennessee, and I saw this savage and cruel behavior. And uh, then I went down to see Francis Joseph Atlas, the cotton, and he was a marvelous man. Had a wonderful family and educated them all. They were all had jobs around the country. And, you know, it was just something that made you want to really see if you could help on this. And the four or five lawyers that made up the efforts on voting in 1960 in the Civil Rights Division. And that's all there were, four or five. Uh, all came out of the honors program of the Justice Department. And they were just, all of them happened to be very good. And two of them were just sensational. And they were just looking for somebody that would say, let's go down. And so the next thing we did was we knew the territory. And the more we got to know the territory, we got to be, have tremendous respect and admiration for the black folks that lived in Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana. And we wanted to try to do something to help them. And that was the spirit. That was the spirit. Yes. <clears throat> 
You have a number of former law clerks to Judge Frank Johnson here in the audience, and I know you had some good experiences in front of the judge. Perhaps you could tell us about your relationship with him and uh, talk a bit about the Viola Liuzzo case. Tell you about what? The Viola Liuzzo case? Yes. <clears throat> well, in, in my memory, there, there is no, there, there's never been a finer district, federal district judge than Frank Johnson. He uh, had such presence in his courtroom with respect to uh, communicating his respect for the law and his recognition that he had a responsibility to enforce the law, that uh, he was just a, a, a real, real man. And uh, uh, when the Liuzzo case, uh, when Mrs. Liuzzo was killed, first there was uh, criminal prosecutions in the state court, and they got nowhere. So then the federal government, uh, brought the case. Now, <clears throat> we had almost a perfect case because there was an informant in the car from which the bullets came that killed Mrs. Liuzzo. So we had strong, strong evidence. But uh, the way Judge Johnson handled the case, all completely fair, but very, very forceful that uh, it was just a exceptional uh, performance. <clears throat> he was a he was a, a, a very very uh, attractive man, uh, but uh, when you were doing court business with him, it was all it was all business, and uh, he he very seldom. Uh, in my in my relations with him, uh, relaxed enough to to uh, uh, have long talk conversations with him about non-judicial things, and he then went on to become a very strong judge on the court of appeals. I think we have a question in the back there. Yes, Mr. Doyle, were you in the Justice Department when President uh, Kennedy and, and Bobby Kennedy helped uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, who was arrested and found in contempt by Judge Oscar, Oscar Mitchell and sent to Reeseville Prison? Get the question. Can you repeat that a little slower? Um, the late Donald Hollowell represented um, Dr. Martin Luther King and Daddy King didn't think that was enough to get him out of prison in Reesville, so he called President Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy to send the Justice Department down to help get Dr. Martin Luther King out of prison. And I was wondering whether you had any comments as to that. <coughs> no, I don't have any. I don't have any personal knowledge of it. I know it occurred. I, I know it was. It was. Uh, uh, very smart uh, thing for a, a presidential candidate to do, um, and I think it was the, the effort was sincere. Uh, but that's all I can tell you about it. Gentleman down here in the yellow tie. Uh, thank you. I'm 25 years into law practice, and I feel like it's folks like you whose shoulders I've stood on all this time. But I want you, if you can, to reflect on what students today, people emerging from law school, might do, other than perhaps to become country lawyers, uh, to find their path to the important civil rights struggles that face us today. Well, I think the... I think the place where lawyers, young lawyers, if in working in civil rights uh, can have a biggest impact is in, is in education. Uh, there's an effort by 
Bob Moses and some of his colleagues to uh, have a, a nationwide conversation on whether or not there should be a constitutional amendment that every child has a right to a quality education. To me, uh, that makes a lot of sense. If, for example, that were enacted and then there was a laws to uh, implement it and a civil rights division was called upon to enforce those laws, I think you could, you could ratchet up the system uh, better than any of the present methods that are being tried to do that. Uh, so that's one area that I think is, is uh, there still is a real need. And uh, this is not just for, for blacks, but it's for poor kids. And uh, 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 it seems to me that, that uh, we, can, we can do a, a lot out of uh, the kindness of our hearts to, to help, uh, help the poor by uh, food stamps and by t tax credits and so forth. And but they need and they, what they want is they want to get jump started so they have an, uh, have an even chance to compete. But if, if poor kids don't, can't make the jump from math to, to uh, from algebra to, to calculus, or you can't make the jump to computers, they're lost f f their whole adult lives. Well, that's an area that really, to me, is, is central to uh, a way we can build a better country. And a country that was founded on reliance and self-reliance and self-respect. Yes. So I wonder if you could share with folks how you prepared for your closing in the Price case, which some people know as the Mississippi burning case. Well, I will. <clears throat> I had a very good paralegal named Dorothy Landsberg, who worked in the summers for me in 65 and 66, I think. And when I knew that I was going to be the chief prosecutor in the, uh, the Shoba cases, um, I had never really handled a criminal case before. I had participated in one election problem, but not a, not a civil rights case in an election fraud in West Virginia when I first got to the Justice Department, and I'd probably try to justice of the peace hunting violation in Wisconsin. So I had to figure out, I had to learn how to do it. And uh, I said to Dorothy, go up to the library and pick out five or six of, uh, final arguments of, of uh, big, big criminal cases, like the Elcher Hiss case, the case involving the, the mafia. Uh, and so she, read, she went in, we got cases and brought the books down. And I read the, uh, I read the closing arguments, but they didn't they didn't, uh, I didn't grab me. I couldn't relate to them really. So I asked her to go back again. And she went back and she brought back a two volume books called, entitled The Law is Literature. And in it were excerpts from our letters or statements or arguments or of really quality lawyers. And I looked at him, thumbed through it, and I came to a case involving Daniel Webster. <laughs> he had argued a 
criminal case. He had been called in to represent the state in a criminal case in 1832 involving a bad nighttime murder. And I looked at it, and I looked at his opening, and it, it, it gave me the, the, the outline, the frame of, of how to cast an argument. But then I had to think of the, uh, what about the closing? Uh, I went further in the book, and there was Mr. Just, Justice Jackson's final argument in the Nuremberg, Nuremberg case. And uh, I read that, and look at the end of it, you probably may remember it. Uh, uh, he said to the, the panel over in, in Nuremberg that. Uh, the defendants will stand before this court like uh, Richard or, uh, did of old when he stood before his queen and said, Say, I slew them not, to which the queen replied, but dead they are. And uh, that was part of the closing. If you find these people you acquit these people, it will be the same to say that the law of Neshoba County is the law of the state of Mississippi. I'm going to exercise a privilege and ask you a question myself, which is you are known for your meticulous lawyering, both in the Civil Rights Division and later in your work during the Watergate time. And uh, you made the interesting comment about how you were actually, I believe, the first Justice Department lawyer to go down actually into Mississippi and other parts of the South to investigate, and that you had learned to investigate your own cases as a country lawyer. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the way that that kind of meticulous, hands-on lawyering ultimately can achieve great results. Well, it's all, it's all, it's all, you, you've got to know the facts and you've got to be, you've got to be sure of the facts because if you don't have that, you don't really have anything. And then you've got to develop a, a relationship with, uh, with your witnesses that uh, they will have confidence in you and you will have confidence in them. Uh, but it, but it's, it's mostly just, just uh, hard, hard work. And uh, <clears throat> the young lawyers in the, in the uh, division really uh, took, took charge of that and, and really worked at it. Um, I, uh, to give you one illustration, shortly after Burke Marshall came in to be the Assistant Attorney General, he said to me, uh, the Attorney General wants a report on what, what, what the division is going to do. And I had a map of the South and <clears throat> in my office and I had a few pins in the map where we had already started cases. And he said, bring your map and come up with me to the fifth floor. So up I go in, and we get in there with the Attorney General and a couple of his aides. And Marshall says, well, tell him what, 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 your, what your plan is. And I told him just what I've told you tonight. We're going to keep the judges busy. We're going to be a case. We're going to have a case in every one of these judicial districts. There's two in Mississippi, three in Alabama, three, I think, in Louisiana. And Robert Kennedy said, that, that's, that's too slow, that's too slow. Uh, he wanted pins in the map the day before yesterday, in every parish, in every county. And, and Marshall says to him, well, General, if you want that, we've got to have more lawyers. And Kennedy says to him, how many do you want? And Marshall says, four, if you can believe it, four lawyers. There's now 550 lawyers in the Civil Rights Division. Uh, and, but I went down and, and I had a friend who worked for, who worked for me as a summer st student uh, 
when I was in Wisconsin. And then he went on to become a naval pilot. And then he went to George Washington Law School. And he was just out of, just looking for a job. And I called him and uh, I told him to get down here the next morning at, at quarter to eight. And he, by quarter after eight, Marshall had hired him. And uh, uh, he'd tell you a funny story about that. And then, then uh, to demonstrate the, the quality of the man, he said, he, uh, he did come to work. And, and uh, several months later, Marshall came in one night when I was still at the office, maybe at 6.30 or so. He said, uh, why don't you go home? And I said, well, I don't go home on Wednesdays. I, well, why not? He said, well, I go play squash at the Pentagon. How do you happen to play squash at the Pentagon? He said, well, I said, I play with my friend, Bud Sather, who you hired. And he's, because of his naval background, he has got admission over there. He said, you really got a lot of nerve. He said, first you hire somebody from your hometown Second, who's a Republican, and third, so you can play squash in the Pentagon. <laughs> but Caesar got the assignment of handling the, the 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 Montgomery, Alabama a voting rights case, and we used to get the voting reg records in these counties, and they'd come up in uh, microfilm, and they weren't easy to handle, and you put them in this machine and you cranked a crank and you looked at them and, and he put his head in that machine and he really literally kept there for six weeks and by the end of the six weeks he had found that there were little pencil marks close to where there was multiple signatures on the, on the registration application and he found that there was 1100 of them that he'd listed and then he asked the FBI to go out and establish the race of the 1100, and they were all white. Now that was brilliant preparation. And when we went before the court, uh, the, 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 the Mont Montgomery registrars didn't have any, couldn't, couldn't say anything. That's actually one of my favorite examples of the meticulous lawyering that was involved in many of these cases because, of course, what the registrar was doing was putting the little pencil dot on the area to show the white voters who might not have understood where to sign, but they were not doing that for rural black voters. And six weeks in the microfilm machine apparently is what it took, but that came up with the evidence that uh, ultimately prevailed. I love that story. Um, do you have any other uh, thoughts about, you've spoken, I think, very eloquently about your interest in and respect for the rural people that you met in your travels in the South. And I wondered if you would like to say anything uh, further about that or also about what you saw in Neshoba County. Well, I, do, I, I, I there, there's, uh, there's two books out. One by, by lawyers in the Civil Rights Division. One by Gordon Martin, who's uh, from Boston. The other by Brian Landsberg, who's from Sacramento. And they were given, as we got moving, you know, we had 30 or 40 cases going, and lawyers had to handle them themselves. And uh, Gordon Martin's book is about Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and, and it's called Count Them One at a Time. And if, if you read it, it's just a terrific uh, compliment to Gordon for, of the meticulous and the detail that he went to get to know these, these witnesses. And he not only knew them at the time, but he followed them up after the case was over, long after he left the Justice Department. But he had a real, really feeling for the type of people they were. And uh, when you read it, you, know, you, you just think, uh, how could anybody have kept those people out from voting? And yet they were, 
They were victims of Saren Lynn in the Lynn case in Hattiesburg that I spoke about. Brian Landsberg wrote a, a similar story about uh, a county in Alabama. And uh, uh, I think those books reflect what we all knew that worked in the field that, that the rural black people in Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana were fine, fine people. And they weren't whiners. They weren't looking for somebody to do something for them. They were honest. Uh, they had strong uh, uh, church uh, affiliations. They had good family relations. They, 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 their kids uh, uh, spread out all over the country. And it was just a wonderful thing to, to, to observe. Let me tell you one more thing. You, you probably have heard of Tallahatchie County, Mississippi. That's where Emmett Till was killed. And because he was allegedly had smiled at a, at a white woman in the late 50s. We went into Tallahatchie County in 61, and we found uh, Tallahatchie County had no blacks registered. No blacks uh, had ever paid their poll tax. And we found four people, blacks, uh, who said they would be willing to give affidavits with respect to their experiences. Uh, one of them was uh, a woman who was a funeral director. And uh, <clears throat> when we got ready to bring the case, Another lawyer and I went down with uh, the affidavits that the lawyers who'd been there before had prepared with respect to the experiences. And uh, uh, I went to Mrs. Kegler's house the rainy, dark November day. And uh, uh, when I got to the house, uh, the, her son met me at the door and he said, uh, oh, mother is sick. She's not feeling well. Uh, and she can't go to court. And I said, well, do you suppose I could talk to her? And he said, he let me in. And I went in and sat in the chair next to Mrs. Kegler in bed. She had a lot of covers pulled over her arm and had a nightcap on her head. And, and uh, she said she was feeling poorly, and we visited a little while. And then I said to her that I was going to go get one of the other witnesses, uh, and then I'd come back for her. And I had no idea whether what would happen, but we, when I got the other two people, to, we were going to do, I decided it would be best we'd take them to Oxford and have the clerk of the federal court take their affidavit. And uh, when I got back there the second time, I got to the front door and just about opened the door. And she opened the door and she was, had her best hat on, her best coat, and she said, I'm ready. And she, she went to court and, and uh, gave an affidavit and then testified very strongly against a sheriff and the registrar of Tallahatchie County. Wonderful woman. Now, you have uh, commented that Neshoba County was a really tough, mean kind of part of the world. It was. And I wonder if you can expand on that a little bit. Well, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the, so much that the, there was a heavy uh, percentage of blacks uh, in the county. The, the, the population of the county was more white than black. But this was bootlegging country and lumber country and uh, the uh, the uh, local whites there the, uh, were susceptible to the uh, campaign of the Ku Klux Klan to join them and uh, and uh, you know, they got when you think about it they they were really got man manipulated into uh, 
that conspiracy by the by the people that were deep in the clan. Uh, and but there was no no uh, nobody saying slow down, and that included the sheriff and the deputy sheriff. Uh, and they used the, all the elements of law enforcement, the, the police car, the siren, the arrest, the planned release, the rearrest, confinement in the car, and, and then the murder, cold-blooded murder, and then burying him in an earthen dam and, and then covering them with 16 feet of earth. Uh, the fact that the FBI f were, was able to locate uh, exactly where those boys were uh, is re really quite an, quite an achievement in law enforcement because uh, the, the earth was at least halfway up to here from the, there uh, when the dam was finished and it was 300, 350 feet long. And six or eight weeks after the murders, the Bureau had got a court order to let them go out there with a drag line and a back hole, back thing. And they went sort of the way out in the top of the dam and they started to dig and they hit, right, hit the three boys down 16 feet, dead right down the nose. So it was, it was tough country. And it was tough country at, at Old Miss, too. Uh, we've got a question over here. You've talked about a number of groups and individuals that, that have to move this nation forward, and, and that includes students and lawyers, sharecroppers, marchers. There's one last group that we haven't talked about, and since it's Veterans Day, let me ask you the question. Uh, I, we have a nationalized guard. And I look at the faces of these young men up there, and they come from Mississippi, communities that probably are opposed to what you're doing. But yet they're the ones that have been nationalized and giving you protection. What was your impression of them? And what, were you concerned that they were going to not you know, back away, turn against you, or did they fulfill the obligations under their new commander in chief. No, I was I was never concerned. I I I, I think the <clears throat> the National Guard in the South, in Mississippi and Alabama, was the kind of a guard that it was intended to be. There was a real contrast in the appearance and the demeanor, the military bearing, and the attitude of the guard in. in Mississippi and Alabama with the guard in Detroit. The, the guard was, there was no comparison between the military uh, purpose and approach that were taken to law enforcement. Questions? I think uh, it may be worth noting that Mr. Dorr is himself a veteran. So thank you for your service on that front as well as the Civil Rights Front. <laughs> Unless there are any more questions, I think uh, I will allow Mr. Dorr to have the last word and then after he has finished saying whatever he would like to leave us with, I hope you will all join us for a reception out in the Hunter Atrium. Mr. Dorr. Well, I do want to say one last thing, and, and, and that is that I don't suppose any, many of you know or, uh, that uh, uh, our first son, Michael, is a graduate of this law school. And he was very proud of the fact that he's a graduate of this law school. And uh, it was a great three years that he had in, in living in Atlanta. He married a young woman from the South and uh, 
he, they decided he wanted, he should go to law school and she came, they both came down here and she worked in advertising and put him through school. They started a family here and uh, one of the, the oldest daughter who was born here is uh, just announced that she's going to be married. So that was, uh, it was a, a good experience for Michael and uh, he's benefited from it in, in the practice that he's had, although he is no longer practicing law, he's running a machine tool company. <laughs> I don't know what that tells you about anything, but <laughs> <laughs> I, want to, I want to always be factual. Well, thank you. We are so honored to have that bond and that connection with the Dorr family, and it has been truly a privilege to have you as our guest here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you all. You.